So this is Larry the Barber Man at the Refinery Salon with Chris Foster, Barber. So where do we start with Chris Foster? Chris Foster has been awarded a Master Craftsman Award. He's been a finalist at the British Hair Dressing Awards, three times winner of the Black Beauty Magazine Barber of the Year. Chris has been granted into the Barbering Hall of Fame to mention a few things. Chris, tell me, where did you start in barbering and what was your inspiration and motivation to become a barber? Um, I started out in a barber shop in Tottenham. Um, initially, uh, actually, let's go back a little bit further in. I did a work experience in a barber shop. And um, there was one particular guy which I focused all my attention on. It was a guy called Orby Cummings because he was exceptionally um, good at barbering. Um, he was a fantastic mentor to me at the level of work experience. I left school and realised that there was a gap. I wanted to do something. I grew up in an area in, in Hackney which was notorious for gang violence and those sorts of things. And I realised that if I didn't find myself decent productive, I'd find myself slipping to places I didn't want to be. So I asked Spawny to take me on as an apprentice and I worked for him for about six months of free, learning craft. And uh, he developed my career, and uh, we created, uh, this is a small barber shop in Tottenham called All These Professional Hair Studios. We dressed smartly, we, 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 he looked at every aspect of the business and made sure it was as professional as it could be. Um, and that was the ethos and that was the philosophy which I built my career on and my education philosophy as well. So that's kind of where I started. Okay, perfect. So today we're at the refinery, which is a salon stroke barbershop for yourself. This isn't the only place that you work from. Where else, which other barbershops do you work from, so to speak? Right, so I'm the creative director for the refinery as a group. Um, and so I'm the creative director for here and in Harrods as well. Um, basically, when I started out, I started charging seven pounds for a haircut. Now I charge four and seventy pounds. So that can, you know, cut and shave £110. Pounds. So I've come a long way in the years I've started out. And I looked at this industry and realised to be the top of the game is really important because then you can actually become and, uh, you know, be able to, to access um, parts of the industry which normally you can't access. So from £7 to 70 that's the kind of progression that happens in a few years. Okay. And tell me how the service in the refinery is different from any other barber shops, in your opinion. I don't think what we do is different to some degree. We still cut hair. We look at the service element and we look at the experience, and that's very key in offering um, services here at the refinery. Um, we try to um, establish a good rapport with our clientele. And from that, we take the client on the journey. I think that's very important, especially when you start that industry, to take your client on the journey. So you start off with your client and find out what they want, but also input. And then say, listen, next time we're going to do this, next time we're going to do that, here's a selection of products that will help you on your journey. I think that's really key because you want the client to stick with you um, and ensure that you have a very secure income. Um, and that's what we try to do here. We try to take clients on journeys to make sure that they feel, uh, you know, very comfortable in the environment that we have here at the refinery. Is that different to other barber shops? I don't know. It's more service driven. Or it's more service, service. service driven to the highest standards. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And tell me, what other gigs do you have outside of the barber shop? So my career is so varied. Um, I've done, I do advertising work um, as a session stylist. As a session stylist, I've worked on, um, I get called to do gigs like uh, London Fashion Week, Moscow Fashion Week. In the past, I've done uh, New York Fashion Week as well. I've gone on tour with um, Usher, Rihanna, Chris Brown, Mary J. Blige, um, Fat Joe. Um, I've done so many different varied things, my friends. My, my career is just one of the most eclectic things. And that's what I, I feel that's really key and important, that you can take some, somebody, a young guy from Tottenham, well, from Hackney originally, and be able to do the things that I've done. It's, I pinch myself sometimes because 
you know, even this year with the academy that we're, we're doing, uh, my academy, we're off to Moscow, do some training out in Moscow. We, um, with the BBA, I'm doing some, uh, I'm do, doing, we're going to do a show in Dubai. Um, I do lots of shows in the UK, like Pro Hair Live, Sun International. Um, so it's, it's just a roller coaster. My diary is very, very busy. <laughs> yeah, barbering for me is so authentic. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper into the Foster, the FOSS Academy. Tell me what I could expect if I came into the FOSS Academy if I had some barbering experience, let's say. Right, so I call it a FOSS philosophy, okay? And my thing is that when I started out, um, I got to a point in my career where I wanted some inspiration. And I looked around, there were no education providers offering me what I needed. And I believe we all need to continue the journey of education and learn and expand in the repertoire of skills and even mentorship as well. We need somebody to push us on our way. The, the top athletes have, have trainers. The, the, if you're a tennis star, you have somebody coaching you. And I believe that's really key. And I found out when I started, well, the pain, I think from pain, you try and type the solutions. And I couldn't find anything, or I couldn't find an organisation to help with my pain. And my pain was I want more. So I decided to focus all my energies on, on the Foster Academy because I realised that if I'm going through this, that other, other people must be doing the same thing as well. So from my years of doing Fashion Week, um, all around the world, from my touring work with um, um, celebrity, celebrities, with all the working in the environment like, such as this at the refinery and working for other groups like General's Conorback and all, all of the such like, I realised that there is a body of knowledge that I've got here. So I decided to use the Creative Foss Academy as a finishing school for barbers. Um, so, you know, you might do what you're doing for many, many years, but you get to a point where you hit a wall. What I can do and what I can offer in my academy is that extra touch that gets you in the right places and the right gigs. Because I've been there, I've done that, I've had the pain, and I've gone through the other end. So that's why I mentor young barbers to kind of look at the industry completely different. You know, it doesn't have to be spit and sawdust. It can be elite, it can be excellent. You can travel the world and see the world and get paid to do that. And I want to show people how to do that. So we could kind of call it the FOSS Factor. Yeah, I guess the FOSS Factor, FOSS Philosophy, yeah. you have all sorts of, of, of ways of putting it and, and uh, wrapping it up. But uh, ultimately, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that I feel is really important um, and is missing in the industry. Even, okay, it's not even barbers, it's even hairdressers get frustrated. And I, I think you look at top name, big names in the industry, you, people want to be like them. Most people want to be like them. Not everybody wants to be like that. That's, that's fair enough. But to access and see the things that I've seen, um, you know, I want to be able to share it with others. And I think I've been so blessed in my career that I think it's important, it's incumbent on me as a professional to share that information and share my ideas and share my experience with others and to help others. Okay, perfect. At the beginning I read out quite a few awards and accolades um, that you've achieved. In your own words, tell me about some of these accolades that you've achieved and why you believe that is. Ooh, right. I think the very first uh, thing that I wanted to do, and I think I advise anybody in the industry, is to try and be the expert. Um, and what that looks like is try and put yourself in a position where you are seen as the go to person. And if you establish that really quickly, it becomes very important, profitable for you because you don't want to keep exchanging too much time for not enough money. And that's what I find a lot of barbers do they exchange far too much time for very small amounts of money. And I realised that very early on in my career, if, you, if you're seen as an expert, if you put yourself out as an expert, if you can command the authority in the industry, you get paid more, experts get paid more. Um, I, you know, I've done a lot of advertising gigs where a company's hunting for somebody who they're seen as the expert. They call up, they look around, 
and they find somebody and that's the person they, they book for these big gigs. So guys, it better be you, because if it's not you, then it's someone else. So that's what my big advice is. So when I do all the awards, they're great, they're great, but to be honest, I think ultimately, you're as good as your last haircut. I've always had it said that, you're as good as your last haircut. So make sure you hit like your last haircut is awesome, right? Because it's your best advertiser. But the accolades do help. And the accolades do position um, the person as a go-to expert. And not all the time, because these things are very varied. Because obviously, there's politics involved, there's something people, people feel that. But I think ultimately, if your work is really good, that's the most important thing. Accolades are great, but your work has to be on point. Okay, perfect. Well, it seems like you're continuously pushing the boundaries in men's hairstyling. Is there a particular style that you're specialising in now, or is it continuously? Guys, I, I would say, I'm, my philosophy, and this is my mantra that I live by, is uh, innovate or die. Um, and when I say innovate or die, it's die creatively, not physically. Um, so I'm constantly innovating. My work is constantly changing. From the, from the time I started out, especially photographically, I try and look at certain things and be constantly inspired by movies, by, um, I go to lots of um, art shows, I hang around with lots of creative people. I think it's so important, especially in this industry, to be as creative as possible, to open your parameters. So not just see, oh, I can just do a skin fade. Mm. Yeah, but what happens when that becomes Unvogue, you know, and it's it's not it's not fashionable anymore. So constantly innovating, constantly looking at. I, I you know, expert with hair color. I expert the way I photograph uh, photograph hair. Uh, if it's a flat top, I see why I can put a twist to it. If it's um, a fade, I will change it slightly. You know, that's really key. And I think what has to happen if to to ultimately be somebody that's the go-to person in the industry. You have to disturb what's going on. So if everybody's doing a skin fade, there's no point doing stuff on skin fades, guys. Seriously. Or if somebody's doing long hair, switch it up. Do something completely different. And that's what I've done throughout my whole career. I mean, I've gone to many collections. So one of my collections I've, I've done was something called Sin City. Um, I spent something like about £12,000 on that collection. Um, if you guys check out the website there, hairbackersfoster.com, you'll see the actual collection. Sin City for me was, uh, it just, it just, I took on the whole role of creating a graphic novel on men's hair. So creating this, this, this graphic novel so you can read a, a, about a story on a hair, uh, on, 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 on hair, on a, what, well, based upon haircuts, get my drift. The main, the main thing was the story behind the hair. Uh, my recent collection, my most recent collection is called, it's based upon Star Wars, using the light and the dark side of the force. So things like that, just do things different. And I think to be noticed in this industry, that's what we have to do. Constantly different, constantly innovating, and constantly keeping it fresh. <laughs> that was cheesy, sorry. <laughs> cheesy ain't his thumbs up, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so this uh, is primarily going out to barbers. Yeah. Tell me and tell the barbers the importance of creating a collection. A lot of them, you know, you're talking of collections, like collection, I'm a barber. Right. Okay, so, um, and this is where my mentor comes in. Um, I'm doing a many uh, different seminars in this year and next year. Uh, for guys, if you want to really know how to, ex to change the game, come on seminars, seriously. I, I, I just, I, I, I challenge you to do it. Uh, I don't do webinars as well. Anyway, sorry, it's just a cheeky plug. <laughs> collections are really important because to, to be seen in the right places, to be seen as an influencer, people have to see your creative philosophy. So, for instance, I just done a, a big advertising gig, I can't tell you who it is because the actual gig is not out yet, I have signed it in the air, I can't say that. But they saw some of my work online, not on Instagram, not on all the social media, they saw some of my work and they said, we want that person to do it. Because there is, a creative thought process behind that. I'm not regurgitating what someone else has done. I've thought about something, I've put elements together, I've put makeup together, I've put photography on it, the, the right type of models. This is a, a, a synergy that happens when you create a collection. And 
creatively it pushes your boundaries because you have to know how to manage all of these elements to create something truly inspirational. Um, that's really important. Putting a picture up of your fade, there is obviously some creative work there, but certain elements are missing. Someone needs to see how you got to that end goal, and that's what's really important. So, for me to do all of the gigs, so when I get booked to do things like go to Moscow, um, Dubai, go to um, I'm off to Singapore later on this year, that's what they've looked at. They've looked at what I've created and how they can create it. Okay, perfect. I have a bit of an awkward question for you. Awesome. I have to ask it. Okay. Do you believe that some educators with half your talent have stole your limelight in the education arena based on social media following rather than talent? Wow, that's a big question. Um, no, I, I tell you why. I feel that following, there's a limit to following, okay? Because following doesn't necessarily equate to financial following. Do you get my drift? Ultimately, people want quality. So, if I want a car, I could get a popular car, right? But ultimately, I want a Mercedes, a Benz, uh, you know, I, I'm not sorry, Mercedes, a Benz, excuse me, a Mercedes, a Bentley, those sorts of things. So, we all aspire for quality. I want a, if I want a nice house, I want something that's of quality, not necessarily quantity. So, Recently, social media is a fantastic uh, vehicle for lots of people, but ultimately that means nothing. It really doesn't because a follower doesn't necessarily mean that they are spending money with that person. If they like a photograph, it doesn't equate to anything at all. W what does it? Does it mean money in the bank? It doesn't. So I believe that I can only put my spell in the industry. I create a YouTube channel. I spent vast amounts of money in a YouTube channel purely because it was my gift to the industry. Um, I don't expect anything back from that. I just want to show people my philosophy of cutting hair. Uh, and I've given that away free. Um, it's lovely properly, it's, it's, it's a professional production. I could charge for it, I could create the DVDs and make money out of it, but I feel that it's important for the industry to see a certain standard of cutting, see it in a certain area. Um, it's on my um, Cross Academy channel and it's called the Mayfair Barber Series. So it's based upon haircuts that are done at a level of an environment such as this in Mayfair. So that's what it is, Mayfair Barber Series. Sorry, cheeky blood! <laughs> um, but yeah, check it out guys, because like I say, um, I've gone back to the question. The question was, has, is it a, no, I don't see it. I think everyone has their place. And I love what I do. And if I love what I do, I focus on my game. I don't focus on anyone else's game. Because if I look at what I do, I look at the road ahead, ultimately that's what will happen. People follow leaders. They don't follow what everyone else is doing. If a leader goes straight for, he, he, he aims for the goal rather than look what else people are doing. I don't look what else. Mm -hmm. or I don't look what other people are doing. Okay, do you think you underestimated the power of social media at the very beginning when you saw a lot of people jumping on it? You, uh... no. no. The very first thing I did was YouTube. I had YouTube, but I used it differently. I used YouTube to promote what I do. And um, I, 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 I did it. I, I had, very early days, I had MySpace. And I loved MySpace because it was, you could pick your page out, you know. So I had MySpace, I went through Facebook. I've used social media a lot because I feel it's important to be seen on those platforms. Um, and I, I, you know, so I, I don't think that's the most important thing. Uh, I've got a lot of work out of it, granted, but uh, I've used it many different ways, but not several ways that I should have. So for instance, maybe I should have had my YouTube channel earlier, but I did a, a channel which is here by Chris Foster which is basically about me doing hair and stuff like exploits, Moscow and stuff like that. We didn't really build any business for me. Get my drift? Like it was like you showing up teaching is four times. We'll get you four times. Like well, exactly. Yeah. Like as, exactly, as exactly. Just showing people that I went there, I went there, you know. You know, so you know, ultimately, um, I, I wish I used the site differently in the early days. Uh, but I was right on it, man. I was right. I was right.
Do you have your hands? What's the show? I said you've answered my question. Good, good stuff, good stuff. Um, what are you loving and what are you hating about barbering right now, starting with what you're loving? You know, when I started out being a barber, um, some mid-90s, it wasn't vulgar to be a barber at all. It wasn't fashionable, it wasn't trendy. All of the people that I looked up to were hairdressers when I started out. I started in a small barber shop in Tottenham, like I said earlier on, and I realised I could only hit go so far with the, the skill set that I had that's just doing skin fades, doing afro hair. I studied, I went to college, I moved on from there. Now, I would say, what, 20 years on from that, the game has changed completely. Um, it's just been amazing the change that's happened within the industry. I used to do shows like Salo International years ago. Uh, I, I was the very first barber. I would say this, at Sun International to do pattern work. 97, um, I worked with a company called Wa, and then quickly after that became part of all artistic team. But I started off doing pattern work at Sun International, and at that time, it was like, whoa, what's going on? Because they didn't see, hadn't seen that sort of work um, presented in the hairdressing arena. So my, my whole career, I've always looked to pioneer and be pioneering. Um, I created the very first app uh, as an educator in the UK called the Foss Academy app and I've got a free app now that's available to download and those little things have helped to change, I feel, or inspire certain people to some degree um, and now 20 years, young, 20 years on, excuse me, it's just an amazing industry and you know, I'm proud to be a barber. In the night when I started out, it wasn't a proud place to be. Um, you know, we have a few other bands of Mary Barbers. We uh, established the British Barber Association. Um, and again, at a time when Barber didn't have a voice. Um, and it just being a part of something that now there's so many different people having a voice in, in the industry was phenomenal, really was. So it's now very phenomenal, excuse me. I'm super past <laughs> It's just a great place to be right now. What I don't like about the industry, uh, when I, because there was no, it's really funny, because when I, I was at a time when barbering was the, the real, kind of re-emergence of British barbering as such, I was, at, I was at the early point of that, that whole kind of revival, there was a lot of barb love. Now I feel there is a lot more jealousy there is a lot more looking at what someone's doing and not liking it. Um, I feel that's really sad because I think if we come together from and unite, this is the oldest industry in the world. Nobody invented barbering, really and truly. The very first profession, apart from uh, prostitution, was male grooming to some degree, you know, mm -hmm. cutting your beard or something. We didn't invent nothing. We didn't, we have not, all we can do as barbers is put our spoke in the wheel, the wheel turns round. You know, I had my time, it would be somebody else's soon. So there's no point reaching, there's no point uh, being jealous of other people. Just celebrate what we have right now because it will be passed on to another mentor, be passed on to someone else. This is why I mentor, because I believe it's time for me to pass my knowledge and my experience to others rather than me keep it to myself and rather than me feeling that like someone else is a threat to me because he's doing something different. And so what? Enjoy and celebrate people. And that's what I do. So Chris, talk me through your role at the British Council, uh, the Hair Council. Tell me your thoughts and tell me your thoughts on state registration as well. Okay. Right, I'm a firm advocate of state registration. Um, you know, in my industry, I, well, I, uh, the key point is this. I started cutting hair and working in a barber shop. Um, I keep saying this at all these. Um, and I was working there for two years. I wasn't trained, I wasn't qualified. Uh, this barber inspired me and showed me the way. But I realized to be taken seriously in this industry, I had to be qualified. I had to go through a process of learning that said that this piece of paper means that I am qualified to do what I do and I have a knowledge and understanding of the process 
of cutting hair. Now at that time, I couldn't just do barbering, I had to do hairdressing. So the part of the qualification was hairdressing with barbering tanned on. So I learned hairdressing. And what's really important is that I learned certain skills that helped me with development of uh, things like being asked to head up shows for Moscow and New York Fashion Week. I had to have those skills because I couldn't tell another member of my team, oh, do that, and I didn't understand how the process worked to dress that hair, to create that hair, to get my dress. Mm -hmm. So it was really important for me to go through a process and be uh, 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 have a, a piece of paper that says, I am a trade barber. Now, I've got an award, which is very, uh, I must, can I, can I go and get it quickly? Yeah, can I go and get it? So uh, this is my ambassador award uh, form from the Hair Council, and I feel very proud to be, and honoured to be given this, because I feel that what's really important is that our industry is seen as a profession. Like I said, Barbara is one of the very first professions that ever existed. So our industry is so unregulated. And barbers, go on, you or anybody, uh, you know, can set up a barber shop. If you've got a bit of money, you can set up a barber shop. But it's not seen um, as a profession because anyone can do it. And I took the hit in, two, in that 90s. In the 90s, I took the hit because I realised that I needed to get the qualifications. So from earning something like about 500 pounds a week, I went to college and earned nothing. But I ensured that I had the skills from education that said I can call myself a state registered barber because I've got the qualifications that said that says I am. And I was really honoured to receive my my master craftsman at the House of Commons, and that was again a great privilege. So I hear you guys. I urge you guys, if you are in this industry and if you want to be seen as a true professional, really and truly get yourself state registered because it's the best thing that we can do for our industry to grow and be stronger if we have a voice that says we are all registered, we have got the qualifications, we have gone through a process of learning that says we are a profession. That's why I urge you to do it. Okay, perfect. And quickly, what are you doing personally to encourage, uh, to make it compulsory? Well, I've uh, been a part of a few think tanks that have got involved uh, with state registration. Um, Sally has now moved on, and it's a great shame. She's a, a great advocate, and she's done some amazing work to push state registration. Uh, being an ambassador, it, uh, you know, through social media, hashtagging, get registered is important. I've done a few events um, with last year for November. So we did a shave off with Gary Machen at the House of Commons. And uh, that was with MPs, and it's really funny because we were doing these shades uh, with the MPs at the House of Commons, and they said they didn't realise, excuse me, they didn't realise that our industry was so unregulated. They didn't realise that I didn't need a qualification to shave him. I could have cut him to ribbons, but he didn't realise that there was nothing in place to protect him, the end user. So. That in itself is really important. That you know, the, the, the message is is, is 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 spread, and people understand that if we are just, the, the 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 general public assumes that we are professional, that we've got certain qualifications, but obviously it's not there. We do need the, the government legislation that says we have all we are all sitting from the same heat sheet. We can all do the right service or the service correctly. Excuse me, I'm getting tongue-tied. It's very early Sunday morning. It's early Sunday morning people. It's like, what, 11 o'clock? Well, it's early. Go. <laughs> Chris, you've been on, appeared on television a number of times. Tell me why these uh, TV shows have called you in particular. What was your purpose or reason for going on these TV shows and what were they? Well, I usually get called on these TV programs for my expert positioning and for being seen as an expert um, in, the, in the kind of producer's eyes, 
they then call me to do these programs to give ideas and, and uh, my philosophy on things like shaving. I was to, asked to do something on Daybreak and uh, Alan Titchmark's show with Miley Class to give advice and my expertise on colouring hair. Um, it's something that I explained earlier on. What's really important is that the industry sees you as an expert. If not only the industry, the outside world sees you as an expert. Um, that's what's really key and that's what's something I really do um, explain in my mentoring program. This industry will push you far if you are seen to be one, the one that holds knowledge. So I do something called the One Program and I realise that you have to be the one. You have to be the one that people look up to. You have to be the one that they, they seem to answer their questions. If they have some sort of problem, you are the one. So even in your area, wherever it may be, in a barbershop in Scunthorpe, for instance, if you are positioning yourself as the expert, as the one, they will come to you from wherever you're, you're, and they will come to you regardless because they know that your position is of a certain level that they will then get the, the information, the expertise, the knowledge that they are, they are seeking. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for answers. Mm -hmm. So I urge you, wherever you are, wherever little barber shop you are, be the expert. Okay, because it's a sundown and give a biblical quote based on what we said. Be diligent in your work and you shall stand before kings. Most definitely. <laughs> and I'm a man of faith and I believe that that's the key. Seriously, that's, that's the key. That's the key. You be diligent and then you will stand before many people. Even kings and, and super kings. <laughs> Is that a word? Is that a super king? What's that then? What's that? Rap? No, that's a DJ. Uh, I don't. I'm not into. You're not into. You're not into dance or? No, no. Larry, <laughs> Jamaican parentage, sir. No. Serious? No, I'm being diligent in my work, not filling my head with foolishness. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> He's diligent with his work. Fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Be diligent in the work you stand for, kids. So, Chris, after after listening to you on this interview, you've obviously got a profound knowledge of the barbering industry. You've been in it for a long time. You've got a lot to say. If people wanted to see you personally, where can they see you? Where are you personally appearing over the next few weeks or months? Where can people catch up with you? Okay, so I've got Chrome Hair Live in April, uh, which next week, April the, I don't know when this interview is going to go out, might, well, we might miss that, that boat. Um, Barber Connect, I have a seminar at Barber Connect, and I have a stand at Barber Connect, so the Foster Academy stand will be there. We'll be Presenting uh, Foss Creatives. I've uh, put together a group of guys that are really creative and again mentoring them in the industry to look out for these guys. And like I said, if you want to be part of the team, please sign up, come and drop an email. I'm here to help people. So if you have a problem, guys, drop an email. Let's talk, let's compensate. So I'm doing that. Um, Barber Connect, Barber UK, got a stand, doing a seminar on Afro barbering at Barber UK. Uh, it's a masterclass in Afro barbering, so really looking at the, uh, the, the things that you don't see or you don't get taught. Um, so that's a little uh, thing for anybody who wants to learn about Afro uh, barbering uh, and mixed texture hair. Um, I am in San International, the usual uh, suspect, San International. Uh, we're in Dubai in May for the BBA, doing um, some seminars out there in May. Um, we have a show in Moscow in October, uh, and I think that's it for this year. I also have um, some seminars that I'm doing, setting out, to, uh, we're doing in, eight, in excuse me, September, and the seminar will be based upon career development, and like I said before, about being the one. So not technical, technically how to cut hair, but it's really about how to maximise your time in industry. We've got a very small amount of time to make it in the industry. And I want to help people maximize their potential, their time and their earnings within a short period of time. And that's going to be in September, so look out for it, social media peeps. Okay, so 20 years career is a long period of time. Yeah. Tell me what was your one greatest moment in barbering over your 20 year career, Chris? Boom! I don't know what that could be. That's several, several. So, okay, so right. Certainly, 
can share my knowledge has to be the most powerful thing for me, right? Um, and be able to connect with people and be able to help people. Ultimately, that is the high point of my career. When I, when I, when I see a comment on my YouTube channel where someone says, you know, you've helped me so much, that, that really does inspire me because I want to do more. I want to help more people. I guess personally, that would be selfish. One of the other high points of my career was being in charge of the largest menswear show uh, for London Fashion Week. Uh, it was done with a designer called Oswald Botan. We had 105 models that I had to look and to prepare uh, for the catwalk, 105 separate different looks, right, in five hours. That was one of the high points of my career. Um, that was, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really big high point. Uh, we had, uh, had a team of, I think about seven barbers stroke hairdressers to help out to, to actually execute all of that hair. It was a, it was, it was a tall order, but 10, 10 hair cuts on average per hour per month. Literally, literally, it was, it was hardcore. We did a lot of preparation beforehand. So what we did was put people in tribes. So the designer wanted tribes, so we were able to, how we, actually, how we did it was, we did a factory conveyor belt. Somebody cut, somebody styled, somebody finished. And that's how we did it, to be able to push through the process of doing all those guys in that time. But that would be, selfishly, right, one of the high points of my career. Okay, perfect. And in, uh, okay, sorry, yeah. you can check that out on my YouTube channel, Foss Academy. No, not Foss Academy, here by Chris Foster. Boom. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, and in closing, because it's coming up to time and you're going to yeah. have clients coming in yeah. any time now, with all your experience, what words of advice could you give to any young, inspiring barbers that wanted to read the dizzy heights that you have, what would be the key words of advice that you would give them in closing? Train with the best, be around the best, learn from the best to be the best. Can I add to that? And if you need to travel to find the best, you pack up your suitcase and you travel. Sacrifice is key. I, I have not achieved what I've achieved from not sacrifice. I've sacrificed a hell of a lot. And, um, and as a man of faith, I believe that when you sacrifice you, and you give to others, the rewards will come back. So once you get to that pinnacle, once you get to that high point of career, share with others. Chris Foster, what, what can I say? That was an amazing interview. Thanks. You've given a lot of Thanks. insight to barbers out there. I'm sure you've inspired people to take their game to the next level based on what you've said today, you know, I mean, you've shared quite a few, a few things. People might have thought that they was at the top of the game, and then after listening to you, I'm sure that they now know that there's still it's a constant and never-ending learning process. Absolutely, I'm not, I wish I was at the top of my game. There's so much more to achieve, um, and there's so much more to do within my well, in my career, I feel. So I'm nowhere near the top, trust me. But hopefully, I can inspire others. Thank you, Larry, for coming down. Uh, now I'm going to go back in the tools because I love what I do. And uh, yeah, it's been great. It's been great. Thank you. Perfect.